us, and I, I really appreciate that. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Lord, as we continue our worship, we give you thanks and praise for, for all that you are. You are worthy of all praise, and we are just grateful. And we ask that your spirit that is here among us open our hearts, that we gain understanding. If we were to just open up your word and try and understand the Bible on our own, it, it, it may not make sense. I wouldn't really hear you, but with you, as our teacher, as our guide, Holy Spirit, we will gain understanding for the benefit of this body so that we can serve you in love and rejoicing. Amen. We are heading into Thanksgiving, abounding in Thanksgiving. What I love about Thanksgiving is not only a time to be with family and to give thanks and to say thank you to one another, uh, but, okay, let's be honest, it's, <laughs> it's the food. Uh, it's, I love food. I love holiday season. I love holiday meals, the big feasts, and however you do that feast, however it is, and whoever you gather with, I love a big table. I love a noisy room at the time when you sit down. I love that. And whether it's you know, a fried turkey or a normal turkey or a smoked turkey or a not turkey or whatever it may be, it, it's just fantastic. And you get the dressing and the stuffing and you know, my, my personal favorite, oyster stuffing, which is not happening, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's all right. Because it's just, hey, you know, when you got six-year-old and others, they won't eat it, so they would do something else. Hey, hey, did you know you can actually take stuffing or dressing, and then use your waffle iron and turn it into a stuffing waffle. Oh, if you have not tried that, oh, please, pull out, pull out your waffle iron. Just give it a try. Just, I promise, you will not be, you will be a changed person. It, it is fan, uh, it's fantastic. But you, you can't, you can't just, okay, you know, it's all just this food. And so, you know, that's, that's good. But the real winner, the big take home, the prize of the day, Oh, yeah, we're talking about pie. It, it is. Pie, all the different kinds of pie. Now, I always grew up with apple and pumpkin, and sometimes there was minced meat, and if you're, you know, sometimes pecan pie, and whatever it is, all sorts of kinds of pie. I love pie. And because it's a, it's a great holiday, it's a, it's a holiday means holy day, which means we give thanks to God. Therefore, pie is forgiven, and you can have as much as you want, and it's okay, and even have it for breakfast because it's blessed. So it's okay. It's okay. So we enjoy that, enjoy however, you because you, you get that great feast and, and, and you have that time to, to consume all this food. And, and then the, the next thing is, and, and this actually, I didn't realize it was a debatable thing in my household because I was like, you know, you know, I know what Thanksgiving means to me. And my kids are like, oh, it's the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. You know, you have the balloons, you got to see that. And then, and then, of course, the big thing, and I'm like, oh, I know, here it comes. And they go, it's the Westminster Dog Show. I'm like... No, it's football. <laughs> football is what Thanksgiving is because after you've eaten all that food, you got to have the TV on with the football game, and I don't care who's playing. I just need to have the next thing, which is your eyes closed, you nap. Yeah. You're not watching the game. You just know that you've got something on, and then you fall asleep, and then like, that's a good day. That's a good day. And, you know, for some of us, though, you know, I know for those of you watching and from home and you're up north and you've got all that snow, Buffalo, I'm sorry. Um, so you're not going to be doing this next thing, and maybe you will. But for some of us, we just say, you know, we've had a great meal. I think it's maybe time to just walk it off a little bit. Let's go for a walk. And maybe your dog's been begging you to, to get out and go for walks. So, all right, let's take the dog out and go for a walk. Or, or maybe continue this conversation that we started, and you and I will go and we'll walk and just kind of walk off that wonderful feast. And I started thinking about the activity of walking. And, you know, in the Christian faith, we use the word or the activity of walking to describe what it means to, to be a disciple of Jesus. That we walk. We walk with Jesus. But how many of you ever thought, well, what does it actually mean to walk with Jesus? What does that look like? Is, is there something that we can learn from walking with Jesus that we can apply to our lives today and through the holiday season and the, and the months to come? I believe there is. And it's rooted 
in walking with Jesus and abounding in thanksgiving. So let's take a look together at a small section from the letter to the Colossians. Uh, This is uh, Colossians chapter 2 from the Apostle Paul, wherein he talks about walking with Christ and being thankful. So Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, and it reads, And you, therefore, have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Continue to walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving. Our walk with Jesus. Walking with Jesus means that we are rooted and built up in him. And that's something we can all get behind. Being in Christ. Christ in us. Something that gives us strength. uh, Renewal. And and a sense of purpose. A lot of of times uh, I hear people eager, learning, like, well, what is my purpose? What, no matter what stage of life there is, if they're young, they're trying to figure out, well, what is my purpose in the world? If they've got kids and they're trying to figure out, like, I know I'm supposed to parent these kids and I'm doing that, but, but what, what is my purpose? You're your grandparent now or you're retired and, and you're like, yeah, but, but what is my purpose? In Christ, we can begin to understand what our purpose is being rooted Having strength bound and bonded to something else and being built up in Christ, in him. That's a good thing. A good thing that should, we should hold on to. It also, it should prompt us to ask another important question. Why, why? Why am I rooted in Christ and built up in him? For what purpose does this happen? Is it for our own benefit? Well, yes, of course. And not just that. So, no, not just your own benefit. There actually is a purpose of why you are built up and rooted in Jesus. And that purpose is that you and I are called, commissioned, charged to go and interact with others. Go be with others. That's why you're strengthened. That's why you're rooted. Now, for some people, this charge, this commissioning to go and interact with other people is a a cause for celebration and rejoicing. Go be with people. Yeah, that's my jam. I got to go do that right now. Let's go. For others of us, to go be with people is kind of like, could I Read a book alone? Will that suffice? Can that, can that be my walk with Jesus? Can I, can I just kind of withdraw a little bit? Because um, being with people kind of fills me a little bit with a sense of anticipatory angst a little bit and dread possibly. Now, why would that be? Well, hey, it may be that we're introverted and being with others is not really our go-to for, for fun and, and joy. However, every healthy introvert understands and knows full well that 100% avoidance of people is a dangerous thing for our well-being. And we know that, all of us, introverts and extroverts, because of what we experienced during the lockdown of the pandemic. Being away from people is not good. It's hard. It affects us negatively. If someone is feeling angst and dread, though, about interacting with people, it could be that that feeling or those feelings are connected to a negative experience that they had with someone else in the past. Additionally, it could be that that place that we're being called to go to, that place that we're supposed to go be with others, is going to include that person who hurt us. This stirs up in us a kind of an inner turmoil that could stem from that hurt or maybe uh, that ongoing comparison that we have between ourselves and that person and it's just negatively impacting us. Any number of things, any number of things. The one thing 
that we really need to be aware of, we need to be cautious about, is whether or not we feel resentment. Resentment. Because if it's resentment, then we're in trouble. Because resentment is a true soul killer. Once our hearts feel resentment towards someone or something or an organization, our internal system begins to attack us. Consider, here's some, some wise reflections on what resentment does to us. Look at these things here. Uh, our fatigue is often caused not by work, but by worry frustration, and resentment. Dale Carnegie. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. <laughs> Nelson Mandela. That's a, that's a smart one. I love that one. How about this one, though? Nothing on earth consumes a man more quickly than the passion of resentment. Frederick Nietzsche. Yeah. I'll admit, that, that's dark. I mean, particularly for a Sunday, and you come and we all come together and we're for, this is the day of the Lord, this is the day of hope and renewal, and the topic of resentment is kind of one of those that like, well, okay, let's move on, let's quickly. Let's look, get out of here, let's, let's move past, past this. Let's not spend too much more time on this. And I, I get it. I do. I understand. I, I would just ask for your patience, though, because I really feel like we need to spend just a little bit more time on this topic. I believe that people, all people, and sometimes, unfortunately, especially people in the church, are easy targets for dipping into the pond of resentment. Some reason or another, we love to bathe in that resentment. And I'm not sure why. So we need to name it. We need to learn about this thing called resentment and, and call it out. See, tough topics require of us a good level of patience with ourselves and others to try and engage in some kind of conversation and I, I understand that in this very moment, you and I are not having a conversation. I'm just spouting, and you're thinking. And we can talk about this later if you want, but, but it does require a good level of conversation, and more importantly, a good conversation with ourselves, which means we need to do some honest self-reflection about this topic. And it's not easy. Oh, I know, it's not. But know this one thing, Scripture says, even though it may not be easy, Scripture says the hardest part of this work has already been accomplished. The hardest part of this work was when Jesus went to the cross, died, was put in the tomb, dead, and was raised up from the dead. That is the hardest part. That's already been done. It's over. It's finished. It's complete. And in that freedom now, we have the in-breaking power of the risen Christ that shines God's light on the darkness so that we can see, name, and watch God redeem the thing that's hidden in the dark. Now, I think it might actually help us for us to read some more from Colossians and see what the Apostle Paul says in the opening chapter, Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power so that you may have all endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, which is the forgiveness of sins. Notice verse 14 is up there twice for a reason, because I want us to key in on that. 
God rescued us from the power of darkness and transformed us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption. Properly understood, redemption is the forgiveness of sins. Your past is your past, but the past does not claim your story. Christ does. That's what forgiveness means. Redemption takes your past, transforms it, and redeems it. Now you are in Christ. You have been taken out of the darkness and brought into the light. This is our home. This is our true home. So, God has rescued us from this power of darkness, brought us into the true family that we really belong. From the time that we were born, we knew we belonged. We just didn't necessarily have the words. We needed somebody to testify. We needed somebody to witness so that our souls could awaken and know, ah, I'm being called home. Jesus is beckoning me to come and be a part of the family. Here is what forgiveness of sins means. It means redemption. And since we are set free from this darkness now, we need to be aware of the things that in us that like to hide in the darkness. Because all of us, Scripture says, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. That means all of us have the possible threat of listening to what's in the dark. And there are things that love to be in the dark That's where they thrive. That's where they grow and fester. And all of us could listen to those things. And we have to be cautious. We have to be careful. Because resentment is very seductive. It initially tastes sweet. Or at least that's what we think it tastes like. And it goes down so easily that we're pretty sure there's no harm done. And that's when we find ourselves in real trouble. Because what resentment does to us is it forces a new perspective about who it is that we have this resentment against. It has transformed that person and demonized them. Now that person is no longer a person. They're no longer somebody's son or daughter. Instead, they are that thing, not a person that thing that opposes us and our perspective. And if we don't let the light of God break forth and shine on it, we can end up as a twisted version of our former selves who rejoice about that thing suffering. Or worse yet, we could actively participate in making that once a person suffer. That's the power of resentment. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transformed us into the kingdom of the beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We are forgiven. And when this happens, which takes place daily, You know, and sometimes hourly. Oh, Lord, I did not mean to say that. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me, Lord. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I didn't mean, I'm sorry. Emotions got the better of me. I really didn't mean to say that. Sometimes we need grace upon grace upon grace. And thankfully, the Lord is willing and able to do so and to give it unto us. That's what it means to walk with Christ to walk with Jesus, to understand that that grace is ready for us each and every hour and every second. Consider also what it must have been like when you read the Gospels and you see the different miraculous healings that takes place, right? If you see these different stories in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John where, where Jesus supplies healing to somebody, whether they had a deformity or some kind of physical challenge and illness. Or, and in some, very, some cases, there was actually death involved, and he brought them back to life. In each of these dramatic healings, Jesus would say something like, Rise, get up, and what? Walk, right? Go walk somewhere. You've been healed. Your sight has been restored. Your legs have been strengthened. Now go walk. And this was a way to demonstrate that the healing is complete. 
What once was is no longer. Now there's only health and renewal. But it is actually more than that, so much more. The call to walk is meant to stir within the subject, the one who's received the healing, and all the eyewitnesses, that they are now being called by Jesus in heart, mind, and soul, their whole being, to turn all of their attention towards God. So in other words, this is another way in which Jesus is turning them with these healings. Rise, walk, means come, follow me, walk with me through the rest of your life. We have been rescued, rescued from darkness and placed in the light by Jesus. This is redemption. That is the forgiveness of sins from darkness to light. You know, the power of light is something that really cannot be understated or even overstated, I think. I mean, consider how much we depend upon light. You know, this service we can do because we have the ability to have light. We can broadcast, we can, we can share it because of light. We can work at night, we can travel by day or night, no matter what the storms or weather does, we can travel because of what? Because of light. We have mastered so much use of light, and there's still a lot more to come. So many more inventions are on the horizon that it's very exciting, an exciting time to see what else can they do with light. Still, we should be a little bit humble about this, because even though we've, we've we stepped into something that I could not possibly imagine, I mean, I, I grew up watching Star Wars and Star Trek, and, you know, I, I saw check off and others call and say, you know, computer, do this. And it responds and, you know, we couldn't even fathom, you know, computers went from these giant things that filled up a whole room for one little monitor to then being in the little device you can walk around in your hand and you can walk in. I can walk in my room though and say, Alexa, turn on whatever, you know, and then it turns it on. That's crazy. That's wild. I can pull up music now and just Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. I used, you know, we used to have to go and sift through and see what's the new release yet from that artist. To go through all the vinyl and see, is it there? Is it there? Is it not? No, they don't have it in stock. And then you, it, now it's just right there. Like last night, I was, I was trying to find something to watch before bed, and, and, and I was flipping through and flipping through and flipping through and flipping through. And, and, and I realized all this swiping, I'm now 50 movies deep, maybe this is telling me something. I should just go to bed because <laughs> I'm not finding anything. I'm like, okay, so, yeah. That's crazy. It's wild what we've done with light. But here's, here's my caution to all of us. We've done a lot with light. We've mastered light. And yet, no matter how much light we think we can bring into the room, the darkness is still there. It's still there. Because we're not God. Our light and what we can do with light does not eliminate darkness. Only the light eradicates the darkness. The light is the one who breaks us free from the chains of what resides in the darkness. And that is the beauty of what is here in the letter to the folks in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. We'll close with this. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is your life, is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. It's just like when you've been baptized, you're buried into the death of Christ and then raised up in his resurrection. You are in light. You are in the family of light. You are a new creation. Everything is made new. And that is a reason for rejoicing and being thankful. That is our celebration. That is our alleluia. Our thankful hearts demonstrate our gratitude for heaping up all the praise upon a heavenly Father. This gratitude builds up within us a resiliency 
that keeps us from going towards the table where the cup of resentment sits and trying to take a sip. We can keep our minds set on things above, not stuff that we see here on earth. We can walk with Christ in this freedom and know that Jesus is our Savior. Not us. We're not our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. And in this freedom, we breathe in holy peace and exhale divine love. To set our minds on things above means that no matter what season of life we face, no matter what we're going through, we have the ability to thank God for the gift of freeing us from the darkness. This is our walk. This is our salvation. This is why we are abounding in thanksgiving. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, O oh Christ. Oh, we need a Savior, and you came down for us. Praise you, God. Lord, right now, no matter what we're facing, no matter what the darkness may whisper or shout at us, remind us who we truly are, and that is we're yours no one else's. God, you have redeemed us and saved us. And we shout with thanksgiving in our hearts and praise on our lips, for you are the redeemer and our hope. Amen.